Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from you. God, it is evident that your presence is already here. Um, Lord, uh, uh, we declare this is the day that you have made. We make a conscious decision to rejoice and to be glad. As we're here, would you speak, God? Your word is already anointed. It's already anointed. So God, would you anoint our ears to be able to hear what you're saying? Would you anoint our heart to be able to receive your words? That we would leave this place not just being hearers of the words, but doers of your word. God, you are the only one that can speak to each and every one of us at one time. We prepare our hearts to hear you, God. Speak in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, We are in a series called Limitless Edition. Uh, We are allegedly at the end of this series. Uh, The reason I say allegedly is that leaves me leeway in case I want to do another one next week. Uh, Y'all be like, Pastor lied. No, I said allegedly. All right. So we're closing out this series um, and we've been talking about what it means to be a believer here at Limitless Church. Um, Not just at Limitless Church, but what it means to be a believer according to the word of God. But um, we, we said that we recognize if you look around, you will see that there are many different ethnicities here. There are many different age groups that are here. There are many different backgrounds that's represented. So, um, uh, uh, It may mean something a little bit different to you when someone says, I am a Christian. So as a pastor, it's my responsibility to make it very clear what it means to be a Christian here at Limitless Church. And so we call that Limitless Edition. And so uh, 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 it is my prayer that this series has encouraged you and it has given you a deeper knowledge of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, My desire is not for you to be a better church attender, okay? My desire is not for you to be a better church attender. My heart is for you to be a better follower of Jesus, okay? And for him to be glorified through your life. The vision of this church, to take the limits off of the way that people see Jesus, faith, and the church, Take the limits off of the way that people see Jesus, faith, and the church. And when we excel in these areas that we've discussed in this sermon series, it allows that vision to come to life, okay? So let's do a, uh, a recap, of you, if you will, over what we've talked about, okay? Now, week one, we said we take ownership of our faith, At Limitless, we take ownership of our faith. We said that it is our responsibility to grow as a believer. It is not our husband or our wife's responsibility for us to grow as a believer. It is not our parents' responsibility for us to grow as a believer. It is not our pastor's responsibility for us to grow as a believer. We are to take ownership of our faith. It is our responsibility to get in the word. It is our responsibility to spend time in worship and prayer. It is our responsibility to hear and know the voice of God. At Limitless, we take ownership of our faith. Week two, we said that there is something in the room. We said that we are committed to being in the room when the doors are open because we believe that there is something significant, there is something unique that happens when we are together in the room. When you come in with your testimony and I come in with my testimony and others come in with their testimony, even when we come in brokenhearted and need to be lifted up, when we come in discouraged, but when we get together in the room something unique happens. The presence of God meets us at our point of expectation and begins to shift our lives. We said that we are committed to attending. Uh, 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 Two weeks ago, we said we give generously. And we give generously because we have received generously. And we trust God to use our resources to fulfill his will and to build his kingdom um, in the local church and the church and the church overall. So we said we give generously. And last week we said we serve 
passionately because we understand that God has given each one of us a gift. He's given each one of us a gift, and we are to use that gift to serve others and to help build the body of Christ. We said each one of us. Nobody can do it like you do it. You have been uniquely crafted with something that God has placed in you, and he placed that in you to use that gift to serve the kingdom of God. And today, I want to add the final pillar of this series, all right? Here's the final pillar. Uh, At Limitless, we believe that we are sent to tell others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our final pillar. At Limitless, we believe that we are sent to tell others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? Mark chapter 16, uh, uh, verse 14 through 15. It reads, After he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and the hardness of their heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So Jesus is here. And Jesus appears to all of the disciples after he is risen, but people came to the disciples and they didn't believe him. So Jesus began to have a conversation with them to get them back in line. And he begins to tell them uh, just about, how, didn't I tell you that I was coming back? Didn't I tell you? Didn't I give you instructions? And after he did that, he began to have a conversation with them. Now, he could have talked about anything. He could have said anything. He could have told them to do anything. But the first thing he does is he sends them. He sends them. Go in all the world and proclaim the gospel. As believers, we are sent and we are uniquely positioned to go and proclaim and tell the others, uh, tell others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're here today and you are not a believer, we're going to take care of you at the end of service. But for everyone else, we have been uniquely positioned to tell people about the difference that Christ has made in our life and and to tell them about the gospel of Jesus. As a believer, there are things that the Lord has placed a heavy importance on. And one of the things that he makes a big deal about is testifying is being a witness or what we call evangelism, okay? Evangelism. Now, if you've been in church uh, for a while, you might have heard this word. You might not know what this word means. So allow me to explain it to you. This word evangelism is the visible eyes and verbal mouth declaration of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the sins of mankind with the goal of converting the hearer to faith. Again, visible and verbal declaration of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the sins of mankind with the goal being to convert the hearer to faith. Uh, The reason that this end part is very significant is because a lot of times we will bring up Jesus, we will bring up faith, we'll have these conversations with no goal in mind. We'll just be talking, but we won't have a goal in mind. But this is telling us that our goal should be to convert the hearer to faith. And it's not just our conversations. It's not just our conversation, but every area of our life. The goal should be that people could see us and we would have an opportunity to win them to Jesus. The reason that we don't cuss people out when they cut us off on Main Street It's because we're trying to be an example. Because it's awkward if you cut somebody out and then you start talking to them about Jesus. 
The reason that we have peace in the midst of turmoil, the reason that we are not moved when things are going on around us, the reason that we walk in love, the reason that we walk in joy, the reason that we, we, we have this sense of assurance is so that when people see us, that we have an opportunity to win them to Jesus. Right now in this season, it is full of tension and it is full of division. It is full of, 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 of tension and division. We will argue people down for our position. We will end friendships. We will alienate family for our stance. And we will die on a hill that has no eternal value. But we will remain quiet about the one who came down from heaven, lived a sinless life that was nailed to a cross and died for our sins. We'll be quiet about that. We don't want to, we don't, we don't want to stand 10 toes down. We don't want to stand on business when it comes to that. We, we want to, on everything else except for this, we are called higher. We are called higher. We are called to be an example and tell others about the sacrifice of Jesus and about the goodness of God. One of my favorite scriptures, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9. It says, you are a chosen race. It says, you are a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation. That word consecrated means set apart. He says, you are a set apart nation that you would proclaim the excellencies, that you would proclaim the wonderful deeds, the the virtues and the perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's not forget why we are believers. Let's not forget why we became believers. We encountered a love and a grace that transformed us and changed us forever. And now we are called to share that same transformation with others so they have an opportunity to encounter a love and a grace that they've never known. A lot of us, we're, 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 you know, we're like, hey... I made it, uh, 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 I got saved, and we're excited. Hey, I got saved, good, good, praise God for that. You got saved, and and then you made it to church. You're like, hey, all right, I'm making it to church. I got my thing together, I'm making it to church. Some of us will go a step further, and we'll begin serving, and we're like, oh, I got this Jesus thing down. I am in there. I love Jesus, I go to church, and I even serve. Mm. And we'll stop there. We'll stop right there because we feel like, hey, I did it. I got all my things. I'm together. We got it. And there's this big piece that we don't ever touch, that we don't ever walk into, that we don't ever evaluate. We're stingy with our Jesus. We're stingy. We don't want to tell people. For whatever reason it may be, we're comfortable at the place of, I got saved, I go to church, and now I'm serving. And we're comfortable there. But God said, I commissioned you. The first two letters in the gospel is the word go. Why? Because we're called to tell people about him. Because we have tons of things that we will tell people about. Tons of things. We eat at a restaurant. We want everybody to go to the restaurant. We will go post about the restaurant. We will leave a review about the restaurant. We will make reservations to go back to the restaurant. We have a great experience with technology or a store. We will tell people about it. And Christ literally changed the course of our life from going to hell to now spending eternity with him in heaven, from living a life in the dirt, in the muck, uh, broken, beat up, disgusted, to him changing our life and us living life and having life abundantly. But we don't want to tell nobody about that. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, the question we have to ask ourselves is do we care enough about others 
to see their lives changed or are we just satisfied with our own transformation? Do we care enough about people that are going to hell or are we just like, hey, I got mine, I'm good? Because that's, that's what it communicates. I'm going to heaven, I'm good. And so what we do is we hide our faces and we keep our, 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 our glasses on and we just try to make it to eternity and make it to Jesus comes or we go. And, and no, 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 that's not what he called us to do. He called us to go. Mark chapter 2, verse 1, I got to get out of here. Jesus returned to Capernaum. A few days later, the news went out. He was at home. So many people gathered together. There was no longer room for them even near the door. Now, Jesus was discussing with them the word of God, and then they came bringing to him a paralyzed man who was being carried by four men, who was being carried by four men, who was being carried by four men. When they were unable to get to him, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above Jesus. Then they dug out an opening and they let the mat on which the paralyzed man was lying, they let it down. When Jesus saw their active faith springing from confidence in him, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. This is an example of who we are supposed to be as believers. This is who God has called us to be. These four men did whatever was necessary to bring their friend to Jesus. They knew that he had a need. And they knew that the only person that could satisfy that need was Jesus. The world has a need. Your family has a need. Your coworkers has a need. Your neighbor has a need. The people you walk by every day, they have a need. And the only one that can fulfill that need, that can satisfy that need is Jesus. But it is up to us to do what it takes to bring them to him. We have been sent. How will the world know about their freedom if we never tell them that they have the ability to be free? We are the ones that they've been waiting for. How long will we make them wait? How long will we make them wait? And we give all kinds of excuses while we don't evangelize. We give all kinds of excuses while we don't want to tell people about Jesus. We say, oh, you know, it's too hot. Oh, you know, it's too cold. Oh, you know, uh, uh, it's pushy. Oh, oh, it's, it's, it's awkward. Uh, 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 what if I get rejected? What, what if I, all of these things. I was reading Paul is talking in, in Acts. He's talking to the church in Acts, Acts 20, verse 24. He says, uh, I don't consider my life as something of value or dear to me so that I may finish the course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus. He says, I don't care about nothing except to testify faithfully of the good news of God's precious, undeserved grace, which makes us free of the guilt of sin and grants us eternal life. Paul says, I consider my life as nothing outside of the responsibility that he's called me to do. He says, my only desire is to do what he has asked of me, and that is to testify about Jesus. And because of Paul's commitment and his relentless desire to do what Jesus said, you and I sit here right now and have an opportunity to hear, to know, and to respond to the message of grace, to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he chose to be relentless about it, because he chose even death to make sure that people had an opportunity, the Jew and us, the Gentile. This has to be the posture of our heart. If those four men were willing to carry somebody to the top of the roof, then remove the roof, then dig a hole, then lower somebody down so that they could have the opportunity to get to Jesus, we have to be willing to do what it takes so that people have an opportunity to know him as well. We cannot let excuses stand in the way of people getting to know Jesus. People are dying in front of us every day. 
They're dying in front of us every day. We can no longer ignore what's happening. We can't let excuses stand in our way. Let's spend billions of dollars. Listen to this. The world spends billion, B would it be? I, I mean, you can't even count that high. Billions of dollars pushing death every single day. Billions of dollars. And they are not ashamed about it. They're not tiptoeing around it. They're not doing none of that. They're like, no, you're going to get this death all day. You're going to get it in the news. You're going to get it in the commercials. You're going to get it in the shows. You're going to get it in social media. You're going to get it in the news. But anywhere, we're going to make sure you receive this death. And we're like, oh, no, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Mm, It's awkward. I don't want to. They don't care. We are walking around with life. We are walking around with living water next to people who are starving, and we refuse to give them the water. We have to get rid of the excuses. I got to go. I got to go. Excuses. We have to get rid of the excuses. Excuse number one. Or, or should I say the category of excuses? The first one is the excuse of I don't know. Now, I've been in ministry a long time, and so evangelism is a big deal for me. Even before I was a pastor, it was a passion of mine to make sure people knew Jesus. As a Christian hip-hop artist, and even as somebody who just loved outreach, I just loved making sure people had an opportunity to know Jesus. And so I've heard all of the reasonings. And so I asked my team this week, what are some of the excuses or or, or the things, because I want to be nice, what are some of the things that we've heard as for reasons that people don't want to communicate the gospel. Here's the excuse of I don't know. Number one, I don't know enough. I, I, I don't know enough to, to tell somebody about Jesus. Yeah. Don't, if you can't say amen, just say ouch. All right. Uh, <laughs> number two, what we say? We say, I, you know, I just feel like I, I don't know enough of the Bible to really tell somebody about Jesus like that. I, I, don't, I don't know enough of the Bible. Or here's the third one. Um, I, I don't know how to lead somebody through a salvation prayer. I hear pastor do it. I can't remember. He talks a lot. I don't know what's happening. Um, I don't really know the salvation prayer to be able to lead somebody through Jesus. And so we say, I don't know enough. I don't know the Bible. I don't know a salvation prayer. Therefore, I won't lead somebody to Jesus. So today, we are getting rid of all of the excuses. Uh, Let me encourage you and let me tell you something that I hope that you remember. Uh, Leading someone to Jesus does not require you to be a theologian. Okay, Leading someone to Jesus does not require you to have a master's in divinity. Uh, Leading someone to Jesus does not require you to know the book from end to end. Now, I encourage you. Y'all already know what I'm going to say. What do I tell you? Read the word for who? Read it for yourself. Don't trust nobody. Read it for yourself. So I encourage you to learn the word, but it does not require you to do that to tell someone about Jesus. Um, the, the, The best evangelism tool that you have at your disposal is you. You are the best tool to lead somebody to Jesus. Your story, the things that God has brought you through, you know how much of a mess you was. Hallelujah. You, you know, you know, and you also know what God has done for you and how far he's brought you from where you used to be. And so sometimes, most times, that is the only thing that you need to lead somebody to Jesus. You tell them, let me tell you something. I was a mess and now I am not. And the reason that I am not is because Jesus, I see that you're a mess. Do you want to not be a mess? Then let me introduce you to Jesus. It's simple. It's simple. You don't got to know everything. You don't have to know it book to book. But let me tell you, your story could be the thing that changes somebody's life. I used to be addicted to this. I used to be deep down in this. I used to struggle with this. I used to be uh, full of depression and anxiety. I used to do this. But then along came Jesus. 
being able to communicate that is the best tool that you have to lead somebody to Christ. I got to go. John chapter 9, verse 25. I love this. I love this because this was me right here, uh, right when I got saved. Uh, I love this. Jesus is healing the blind man. The blind man gets healed. They come to him and they ask him all kind of questions. And he like, I don't know what y'all talking about. He says, listen, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. Simple. Simple. He was like, all that there you talking about, I don't know nothing about that. Here's what I do know. I was blind, but now I see. I was sick, but now I'm healed. I was addicted, but now I'm free. I was uh, in lack, but now I have sufficiency. I was leading, going down a wrong path and a destination for my life, but now I have life and I have life more abundantly. That's sometimes that's all you need. All right. We got to keep going. Okay. Okay. So, so the, what was the last one? The last one was, uh, 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 I do not know how to lead someone through a salvation prayer. I understand this. This one I will give you, I'll give you some grace on this one. Cause you're like, pastor, I, I just, it's a little hard for me. I, 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 you know, what if I say the wrong thing? Well, I, I don't really know what to say. I got you. Uh, there was a song I used to sneak and listen to when I was young. Um, by Michael Jackson, and um, uh, uh, it went like this. It says, uh, A, B, C, easy as one, two, three. Talk. All right, I can't sing no more because they're going to cut the live stream off. Copyright. All right, so uh, it's very easy. It's easy as A, B, C, okay? Say it with me. A, A B, B, C. Leading someone to Christ, the salvation prayer is easy as A, B, C. And you're going to remember because gonna, every time you're going to be like, oh, Pastor Keenan was singing that thing. A, B, C, okay? Here we go. A, admit. B, believe. C, confess. Very easy. Here we go. Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner and that I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he died on the cross for my sins and rose again. See, I confess my faith in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I commit to following him. Thank you for your grace and for the gift of it. It's easy as A, B, C. Now, I'm a, we're going to leave that up there. Uh, uh, um, Get your phones out, people. Come on, come on, come on. Get, get the phone. Get your phones out. Get your, oh, y'all, oh, y'all think the Lord ain't going to give you an opportunity this week. No, he is. I already prayed about it. Get your phone out. Take the picture because you're going to need this. You're going to need this. You're like, what did Pastor? I know he said ABC. What was A? Wait, you know what? I got it in my phone because Pastor Keenan told me to take a picture. There it is right there. All right. A, B, C. Admit, believe, confess. You have this opportunity to lead someone. And let me be very clear, because people will be like, oh, I don't know, meh, 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 meh. There is nothing specifically unique about these words. But my job is to equip the saints. The Bible says it is the job of the pastor to equip the saints, to do what? For the work, right? So I want to equip you with something that is easy and a tool that you have at your disposal because somebody going to come to you this week or next week and they're going to want to know about Jesus and you're going to be able to say, you know what? I, I, where that picture at? I just... And you're going to start singing. As soon as they say, you're going to A, B, C, easy as one, two. Like, Yeah. Admit, believe, and confess. What do we want to do? We want to get rid of the excuses. I want to equip you with the tools necessary so you can do what God has called you to do. Amen? Uh, next week, we will have uh, these cards that will be available at the connection table because uh, uh, you're going to need one. So I suggest you grab one, uh, put it in your car, put it in your wallet, put it because you're going you're gonna to pull it out and you're going to be like, you know what, let me, let, me, let me pray with you real quick. You know, it, 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 boom, there you go. Why? Because eternity is on the line. And when we pray for God to do something, I think God is up there like, no, I don't want people to get, no. He's like, yes, I will open the door for you to be able to do this. All right, I got to go. The excuses of I don't want to. That's the second set. The excuses of I don't want to. They, they wrote it. You got it up there. They wrote it. Uh, I didn't write it like that. They wrote it grammatically correct. I wanted it, um, wrong. I wanted it wrong. I don't want to because that's what we say. I don't want to force anything on anyone. You know, I don't, it's just, I don't want to really force anything on anyone. I don't want to step on anybody's toes, right? I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to come off as judgmental. This is what we say. 
And we fail to realize that in our desire to be palpable, in our desire to be right, we forget that the gospel is anti. The gospel is very anti. The gospel is anti-culture. It is anti-tradition. And it is offensive. Well, you know, I feel like, you know, there's not just one way to God. I feel like there's many, the devil is a lie. There is one way to God and his name is Jesus. The scriptures say, no man come to the father, but by me. That's what the scripture says. That's offensive. That is offensive to others. Are you telling me that if I don't accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, you're telling me that a loving God is going to send me to hell? Yes, because that loving God is just, and he gave you an opportunity, and so you have a decision to make. See, see, that, that's, that's touchy right there. It's touchy. But we are called to, to spread the gospel and proclaim it anyway. Why? Because the world don't care. They're pushing it in our face. They don't care whether we like it or not. We are called to proclaim Jesus Christ anyway. The world wants to force what they deem correct on us and what they deem as what should be on us. We have to continue to unashamedly wave the banner for Jesus Christ like never before, especially in this season, especially in this time where right is wrong and wrong is right. Paul is talking to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. He says, for now, am I seeking the approval of man or God? He said, or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, if I were trying to make it comfortable for them, if I was trying to get them on, I was trying to get on their side, he says, I would not be a servant of Christ. The gospel is offensive. Preach it anyway. It is actually the offense that makes it the gospel. Because the world says, you know what? Do whatever you want to do. It don't matter. There's no consequences. Treat people how, how you want to. But the, the, Jesus says no. He says you, you, you put others before yourself. You treat others uh, 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 as, as better than you. You serve people. You love one another. The world says, if somebody do something wrong to you, forget them. God says, no, seven times seven times seven, you forget. It is very anti. Romans 116, one of my favorite scriptures. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm not going to be ashamed of what it says because I understand that there is power that is associated with the gospel and the name of Jesus Christ. So I don't care what they say. This is the foundation for my life. And if it's not in here, then it's not in here. If, if it's not here, it's not going to be here. I am unashamed of the gospel. The last one, the excuse of what if. Now, this is a trick that the enemy has been using since the beginning of time. The excuse of what if. And the enemy is very tricky with this one. What if I can't answer the questions? What if, what if I, I don't know what to say? What if I get rejected? These are things that the enemy uses ahead of time to get us to a point of inaction. Because we can't figure out what we're going to say. We're so afraid that if we get rejected, we're so afraid that we can't answer the questions that we preemptively make a decision to do nothing. And we say, oh, well, I'll just get him to church. Yes, get him to church. By all means. You can get them saved right there. I think we forget sometimes. We're like, man, if I can just get them to church, if I can just get them to church, you are the church. This is just a building. You are the church. And they came to you. You have already been uniquely equipped and positioned to tell people about the day and night difference that Jesus has made in your life. You already have everything you need. You have been equipped 
to communicate the gospel of Jesus. You could do it right there. You are already qualified. The day you said yes to Jesus, you became qualified to tell somebody about the goodness of God. Mark chapter 13, verse 11. See, this is not a new thing, and I got to show it to you in Scripture so you say it, so you believe it, so you see it for yourself. Mark uh, 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 chapter 13, Jesus says, when they take you and turn you over, don't worry beforehand about what to say. But say whatever is given to you by God in that hour. Here we go. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit that will speak through you. See, you trying to figure out what you're going to say. Don't worry about it. When you get in that moment, it's going to be bubbling up out of you and you, you won't even remember what you said. Because the Holy Spirit on the inside of you will begin to speak through you to be able to communicate exactly what they need at exactly the moment that they need it. It'll be right on time. Mm. And Paul, Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus. I got to show you this so you know it's not just you. Paul, the guy who, who a snake bit him and he was fine, the guy who laid hands on people, who, who wrote a great portion of the New Testament, he dealt with the what ifs as well. This ain't a new tactic the enemy's using. Says Ephesians 6, he says, pray for me. What? He say, pray for me that words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation for which I am an ambassador in chains and pray that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly and courageously as I should. It says, pray for me that, that I say what needs to be said. The disciples and Paul all had the same questions, but they chose to go anyway. Regardless of the what ifs, regardless of the questions, regardless of, of their feeling of inadequacy, they chose to go anyway. And because they chose to go anyway, we stand here today. We sit here today as a product of their decision. Having encountered the grace, the love, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are fully empowered to tell all those we come in contact with the day and night difference that Jesus has made in our life. Question is, will we do it? You've been sent. You've already been sent. You've already been quit, equipped. You have everything you need. Will you go? close with this Romans 10 verse 14 how will people call on him in whom they've not believed and how will they believe in him of who they not heard and how will they hear without a preacher or a messenger and how will they preach unless they are commissioned and sent for that purpose just as it is written and forever remains written. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. How will they hear without a messenger? And how will the messenger speak unless they have been sent? You have been sent. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, he didn't offer parting advice. He sent them on a mission and a purpose that echoes throughout eternity. And we are part of that legacy. We are uniquely positioned in our families, our workplace, and our communities to share the gospel of Jesus. It is not a suggestion. It is a commission. It is a calling. 
And in a world filled with division and strife, we are called to be vessels of grace, not just in our words, but also in our actions. The question is, are we willing to risk discomfort so that someone can spend eternity with Jesus? Or are we more passionate about our opinions than sharing the gospel? We have been sent. The question is, will we go? I pray this week that the boldness of the Holy Spirit will rise up on the inside of you. I pray this week that someone would have an opportunity to hear the message of Jesus through you. And don't be discouraged if they don't receive it. Miss Bonnie told us, or Miss Bonnie, where you at? She in here? Miss Bonnie told us a story earlier. Consistently, her coworker began telling her the message and encouraging her with Jesus three years. Three years consistently. And one day, she decided to say yes. And it has changed the course of her life, my life, and the life of many of those around us simply because someone chose not to give up. Some plant a seed, some water. God gives the increase. God gives the increase. Will you go? Every week in this series, I've given you an opportunity to um, respond to the message, and today is no different. I want to challenge you guys to take a practical step in faith right now. I want you to think of one person. One person that needs to hear the message of Jesus. Just put them in your mind. Just think about them right now. If you're getting baptized and you need to change your clothes, go ahead. But for the rest of you, if... if, I want you to think of that one person. And when you get that one person in your mind, okay, I want you to go, I want you to think about that person. And then I'm going to have you take another step. Okay? I want to do something significant today. You got that one person in your mind. All right? Uh, To the right of each row to the left. Did we move it? Okay. To your right, on the end of each row, there's a sticky note. If you're on the end of the row, congratulations, you are now an usher. Please grab a sticky note and hand that, pass that sticky note down. I hear you're an usher today. Grab that, pass that sticky note down. And I want you to be thinking about, thinking about that person. Grab that sticky note. If there's not one on your road, just raise your hand. Our ushers have them. They'll they'll get them to you. Okay, so I got three in the back that need one. Okay, we got tons of sticky notes. We bought like a million of them, so we, we got enough. Pass them down. Take one, pass them down. Should be on the end of your row. Look in the pocket, look on the floor. There we go. We got them coming. Get that sticky note, pass it down. As you're thinking about that person, we got them coming down. There we go. Your usher is making sure you get one on your row. Everybody got one? If you don't have one, raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one. All right, everybody got one. Good. I don't see any hands. All right, we got that person in our mind. Can you lift that sticky note up for me? Lift it up in the air. If you have that person in your mind, lift that sticky note up in the air. We're going to pray over them right now. Eternity is on the line. Hallelujah. Thank you for revival, Jesus. Raise that sticky note up in the air. Okay. Heavenly Father, we pray for this soul that is represented. God, I pray for revival in the life and in the heart of this person. 
God, I pray that even now you have already been revealing yourself to this person, that you've already been showing your grace and your mercy to them. God, we thank you for the opportunity to close the deal. God, I thank you that you've already uniquely equipped us to minister the gospel. And in this, in this moment, in this opportunity, they will come to know you. Thank you for revival. Thank you for salvation being received through the communication of the gospel. I thank you for it. We declare it is so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Write that name on that sheet of paper. And as you're writing that name, I skipped over this, but I want to make sure you hear it. As you're writing this down, you say, Pastor, but how do I do it? How do I communicate this? Number one, you pray. Lord, show me what to do and what to say. Number two, you continue being the example. You just live your life. Let your life shine amongst men. That they would see your good works and they would glorify our Father in heaven. Number three, as you are the example, God will present you an opportunity. You don't got to go out your way. You don't got to do nothing special. God will open the door. Number four, be aware of the opportunity. And when that opportunity comes, be bold and close the deal. Be bold, close the deal. Be bold close the deal. I had an opportunity this past week and I'm, I'm at a restaurant and I'm trying to eat my dessert and I got this waiter there and we're talking to the waiter and, and we get in the car and my wife says, we missed it. I say, yeah, we sat there and talked for 10 minutes and I didn't close the deal. When I got home, I prayed, Jesus, I, I, I apologize. If you give me another opportunity, I'm closing the deal. And God being God presented me another opportunity and I went in with this mindset. You're going to get this Jesus. <laughs> Plain and simple. You're going to get this Jesus. And at the end, I got an opportunity to pray with them. I said, hey, what you going to do? We here now. And that person received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Why? Because I went in with the mindset you gave me this opportunity. I pray for it. We here, I'm closing the deal. My prayer is that that person in your hand, you're going to get an opportunity to close the deal. Here's the last step. Y'all ready? This is it. I believe that something happens when we come together and pray together for a thing. Okay? So what I'm going to challenge you to do is I want you to take that sticky note. Remember that name. Pray for that name all this week. But this is what we're going to do. Uh, Adriana is going to lead us in worship. And in this worship time, I'm going to challenge you to bring them to the cross. Bring them to the cross. Those four men brought them to Jesus. And today, symbolically, we're going to bring them to the cross. My ushers are here. They have push pins. And I want you to bring that name and put it on the cross. And once you put it on that cross, we are going to sing. And I want you to sing in victory as if it has already happened. Go. Yeah. Take it. Bring it. We got time. We got room. We're going to worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now Jesus from the mountain and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the dark.
power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every name that was placed on that cross. We believe and receive salvation in the name of Jesus. We declare that their life is redeemed from destruction. God, I thank you that salvation is coming to their house. Today is the day of salvation. We declare it is so in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Very quickly, if you're here today and you have not made Jesus Lord of your life, I can't think of a better message than this one. So if you haven't made him Lord of your life, today is the day of salvation. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. As Lord. That means king, ruler, reigner over everything in your life. Maybe you've made him in case of emergencies only. Maybe you've made him Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day Jesus. Maybe you've made him when something goes hard Jesus. No, he says you need to confess him as Lord. That means he is the ruler and reigner of your life. And he says when you do that, you shall be saved. And so if you've never made him Lord then today we want to offer you that opportunity. Secondly, maybe you made him Lord, but your life hasn't looked like you made him Lord. Maybe there was an opportunity or a point in your life where you did receive him as Savior, but you, you, you haven't been following him. And you would like to recommit your life to Jesus. We want to offer you that opportunity. The wonderful thing that I love about Jesus is he says, I haven't gone anywhere. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I'm right here with open arms, ready, willing, and waiting to receive you. Why? Because I love you that much. So if you want to recommit your life to Jesus, then we want to offer you that opportunity. We would love to pray with you. And lastly, if you're here and you're just in need of prayer, you say, Pastor, hey, I'm believing God for something. I, I'm in need. I, 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 there's something I need someone to agree with me in prayer on then we want to pray for you. We want to see God be God in your life. And we want to have the opportunity to participate in that. So if either one of those things apply to you, salvation, recommitment, or prayer, would you grab your Bible, grab your book pad, whatever you came with, and meet us over to uh, my left, your right here. Our altar team is ready and waiting to pray for you. If that is you, don't wait. Don't wait for somebody else to move. You get what God has for you. This is between you and God. Get it right. Get it done. Why? Because we believe eternity is on the other side. So if either one of those things apply to you, make your way to our altar. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We got altar team. We got altar team is ready. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for what you continue to do in the hearts of your people. Thank you for how you're already moving. As we prepare to celebrate baptisms, God, we thank you for those who are making a choice to go public with their faith today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the decisions that were made that led to this moment. We honor you. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Don't forget, live limitless. If you are, uh, we would love for you to celebrate baptism with us. Please exit out the door to the right. Grab your kids and we will meet you in the parking lot to celebrate baptisms.
Waiting for change to come 